I'm going to start out with a story. It's a true story. Um, there's a fairly prominent security software firm, and one evening they lost their connectivity. And what do I mean by they lost their connectivity? So they had two high-speed connections to the internet, and they became useless. So essentially they were clogged with traffic that had nothing to do with anything other than to clog those links with traffic. So here's a security firm whose bread and butter requires that they have a connection. And it's actually a pretty good security firm. They really knew what they were doing. And so this happens to them starting on May 4th, they're down for 17 hours. So 17 hours, the security firm has been knocked off the internet by somebody using a security flaw. 13th down for eight hours, 14th they were down for hours, and so forth, and not until the 16th had they made arrangements with their internet service provider to help mitigate the traffic. So they were down for a pretty significant period of time. Again, they also had opportunity costs. Here's their reputation. Their security firm, they're being taken down. Why did they get taken down? Well, a 13-year-old kid in Kenosha, Wisconsin, with the handle Wicked, was retaliating for something supposedly said by one of the, the security firm CEO. And they were, Wicked was taunting the firm via social media. You know, the reason for me and my two other contributors to do this is because in a previous post, you called us script kiddies. At least so I was told. <laughs> so I teamed up with them and I knocked down, knocked the hell out of your Cisco router and I'm building up more bots for his botnet. So what does the firm do? Well, they contact Wicked's ISP and they give the ISP lots of details. They give the ISP Wicked's IP address, I think they probably knew what house it was, gave the ISP lots of information, and this security firm had fairly high-level contacts at the ISP. ISP does nothing. So the security firm decides, well, let's contact the FBI. This is pretty serious. They're taking down our business. And it's not like we have a little connection to the internet. So they contact the FBI, and the FBI has really good, competent, knowledgeable folks. So they actually understand what's going on. Kind of refreshing. But until this firm could prove there was $5,000 in loss, it's technically not a crime. And the FBI pointed out that it cost $200,000 to prosecute somebody. And this stuff is kind of kid stuff. And by the way, this kid is a minor, so nothing's going to happen anyway. So the FBI didn't do anything. They really felt that their hands were tied. Pretty amazing. You've got a business, relies on the internet, pretty substantial security firm. You get taken down by a 13 year old because he thinks you said something that. Uh, degraded him. Contact the ISP, they can't help. Contact the FBI, they can't help. Now, there's a great write-up of this, and I'll put a pointer up so you can see it. But in the end, the CEO writes, I hope it is becoming clear to everyone reading this that we, can <clears throat> we cannot have a stable internet econ economy while 13-year-old Children are free to delay or deny arbitrary internet services with impunity. So the, the CEO is Gibson, Steve Gibson, Gibson Research, and this is from 2001. True story, 2001. Now, in the year 2000, um, I had the opportunity with. Uh, handful of other folks from universities to attend a meeting at the White House to talk about these kinds of attacks. And it was cool. It was in the Situation Room. I don't think 
after 9-11 that could happen. So I get to talk to the FBI, the DOD, NSA, CIA, a bunch of people, room was packed. And they were talking about this problem. And they said that what they were seeing in the wild was the development of tools to create large botnet, botnets and to essentially construct attacks and these tools were getting easier to use. They were getting more sophisticated and easier to use. So lower threshold if you actually wanted to do one of these attacks. And they were pretty concerned about this. So this is a year before this happened. And again, this was 15 years ago. So what changed? <clears throat> Why is this something we worry about today? Well, we've sort of lived under what I'll call the big sky theory of safety. And that is the internet is a really big place. And if a bunch of people are being attacked, it's probably not me. You know, planes don't collide in part because there's a lot of space for them to fly in. The DDoS tools are more accessible today and more sophisticated. And networks are generally more reliable and relied upon. So in 2001, while to, to the security researcher, this was an absolute catastrophe, if we lost our internet connection for a while, for many places, it'd be a bad thing, but not a catastrophe. And so, you know, now these create more of a problem because we rely on the internet for so many things. You know, one of the things that's interesting, and I'm going to talk about a specific example pretty quick here, there are non-obvious dependencies. So at IU, we use Box, which is a cloud-based service for providing file storage. Now, to authenticate to Box, we use the servers at IU to authenticate to Box. So when we log into my Box account, it's actually through a web server at IU that I log into, and then I access Box directly through the cloud. Well, let's say I use internet connection goes down. Well, if I'm on campus, I can't get to the box cloud. If I'm off campus, I can't get to the authentication. So I now have this dependency. I think, well, I'll go to some other school that doesn't have this problem, or I'll go home where I have a good connection through my cable provider. But if I use down, all of a sudden there's this interdependency, and you're kind of out of luck both places. Now that's the same now for I use learning management system. And it's a common situation for higher ed that you now have many applications that depend on the campus having connectivity and users at home having connectivity. You expect to be able to do anything regardless of where you are. I'm on campus it ought to work. I'm off campus, it ought to work. And now we have a lot of our infrastructure that's kind of split. And so both have to work. So what is an attack? And I won't go into a lot of detail here, and, we can, and we'll have a question and answer period. But essentially, a DDoS attack is when a large number of compromised computers out on the internet start flooding a target. And that target could be a router, it could be a web server, it could be anything that's connected to the network. And so what you have is you might have 80,000 or 800 computers spread out through the internet that have some software running unbeknownst to the owner of the computer that lets someone tell that computer, start sending this traffic to this thing I want to attack. So it's not easy to see. So one computer might not be sending a lot of traffic to IU, but 80,000 computers sending a medium amount of traffic might turn into a lot of traffic once it gets to IU. Again, this used to be pretty, used to be pretty sophisticated to get the software on board those computers and to control the software. And that's not the case anymore. So, so if people are interested in doing this, and they look in the right places, 
you can find the tools to construct what you need to infiltrate systems, to put your botnets in control, and also to, to control them. And it's worse than that. You can go to sites where you can, quote, test bandwidth and target something. And you can also pay to have this done. And we're going to talk in a second about where somebody paid to have this done, and it was very destructive. Now, how frequently do these attacks happen? Much more frequently than we thought. So at IU, you know, you occasionally have reports, maybe the wireless didn't work for a few minutes, or maybe a building, they seem to be having a performance problem for a short period of time. And if you're not looking for the signature of a DDoS attack, you may not understand what really happened. So this is part of a log file um, from the IU Bloomington campus, a real DOS attacks that took place, those are the dates. And you'll notice the circled one is the longest one. So we get these frequently, but they're short. So the longest one was about 15 minutes. And the others are really just a few minutes, a couple minutes long. But look how big they are. You know, up to six gigabits per second. And we see them up to, I think, 15 or 18 gigabits per second fairly frequently. And here are the number of sources. In other words, the number of infected machines around the world that are contributing to this attack. So you can imagine if you were sending six gig to somebody's wireless network, it might have an effect. Or to a building network. And let's say your campus was connected at 10 gig. Six gig might have an effect. And you might not notice it. it Maybe short duration. Now, most of these attacks appear to be students attacking students who are gamers, online gaming. So maybe you're good at some online gaming thing and somebody's upset, and they could go to some of these sites and easily attack you, at least briefly. IU now has equipment in place that can allow us to identify these. And as soon as we put that equipment in place, we started seeing them. So obviously it had been going on for before, you know, before we put this in place. Now, these are mostly nuisance attacks. And IU has put mechanisms in place to prevent these attacks from having any impact on the service. So we have a set of essentially rate limiters in routers, and they, they're cascaded from the Indiana Gigapop on down to the campus. And when we see a lot of traffic with certain characteristics, we're pretty sure, almost certain, that a lot of that traffic is not useful traffic, and we can drop it. So today, we might see a six gig attack, but we know that just a few hundred kilobits or a megabit is actually making it through to the target, and it's not service impacting. Before we were watching, we didn't know to put that stuff in place. And in fact, um, Seth Garrett, along with some other people um, in the campus in the Indiana Gigapop networking group, came up with some pretty unique ways to take advantage of hardware we have to police these down. And that's another link I'll put up. Seth did a really good presentation uh, to the Internet 2 security working group a while back on exactly what we've done. Here is a distributed denial service attack that did impact service. And this one got our attention. Um, what's interesting is, I think the day before this one, there were some smaller attacks that were essentially reconnaissance. So the attacker was trying to understand what we might be vulnerable to. And, you know, at, at 420, we had an attack that affected our data center firewall. So there was a particular weakness in our firewalls that let you essentially consume their resources by sending a lot of small certain kind of packets to them. And I think that was the, the attack where they had done some, some essentially 
uh, testing the previous day to see if that was going to be a problem. Then we had another attack later, and you can see, I know this is chart is hard to, hard to see, but the width of those colored areas is how much time they appeared. And for example, this one started at uh, 5.20 and ended at 6.10, I think. And the area is the amount of traffic, and the top is, is the rate. And these attacks are different kinds of attacks. So somebody was trying to disrupt access to systems that were in the Bloomington Data Center, and it was effective. So they, they did. Now, what do we do? Well, we found um, some software upgrades for the firewall that prevented uh, this kind of attack from having the same effect. And I, I think we also did some filtering. Now, when the attack first happened, my recollection is we were in the middle of something else with this network, and we weren't certain. <laughs> you know, sometimes when something goes wrong in a network, the first thing you do is say, who's changed something? Who's touching it right now? And we were touching it right now. So it wasn't immediately obvious where we should look. But when we did look, when we had an opportunity to step back and figure out what was going on, we had collected data, fortunately, and we were under attack. Okay, what's the worst case scenario? You all are sit seated now. <laughs> How many of you have heard what happened to Rutgers? Okay, a handful of people. So it's a pretty interesting story. Well, to us, not, not to Rutgers. Um, there was a pretty substantial attack. It happened over um, multiple time periods. It was targeted during uh, intense activity of the university to create the most disruption. And it took Rutgers off the air when it was occurring. When it first happened, Rutgers had two 10 gig connections to an internet service provider. And that internet service provider also had financial customers that used its backbone. And so that internet service provider, first of all, the attack filled up both 10 gig connections. And so that service provider turned them off, turned Rutgers off, disconnected Rutgers. You know, they had a decision to make. Rutgers was under attack, A, so they weren't useful, and B, they have financial customers um, that might be impacted and would have a serious consequence. This attack went on, off and on, for a long period of time. And in fact, there is an article in the Chronicle, this is so unfortunate, Rutgers decided they would harden their network. So in the future, this kind of attack wouldn't have the same impact. And so they needed to spend some serious capital to ensure that wouldn't happen. And they rose that capital by raising some student fees. So they raised tuition, actually. I think they raised tuition. So they raised tuition in part to cover this new capital expense. And they had spent the money. They installed all the stuff. And then they got attacked again with about the same effect. Pretty scary. The whole time, the campus is being taunted by the attacker. So the, the attacker is on social media taunting the campus. So here is a reporter was starting to interact with the attacker. And, you know, the attacker is getting paid for this, they find out. And the attacker says $500 an hour. I, I don't think that's correct. I've done some research. Um, about $500 a day is what it takes to take down a huge site, which is a Bitcoin a day. And that's this like standard price. So if you want to take down a large university with two 10 gig commodity connections, you just need a Bitcoin for each day. And the reporter wanted to know, why, you know, why are you willing to talk to us 
And apparently the person who was paying this attacker wanted to make this really public. So obviously somebody unhappy with Rutgers. Now Rutgers brought in the FBI. To my knowledge, they never found out who the person who actually ran the attack nor who was motivated to pay for the attack. Bitcoin's great. You can make payments and nobody can track you. Bitcoin's really cool. So the worst case scenario is pretty bad. And, and it was bad in, in ways that you might not anticipate. So at first, Rutgers was giving instructions for students on alternate ways to get in. And they were doing this in such a way that the attacker found that information and would change the attack. There was a, a problem communicating internally with Rutgers. So Rutgers had a challenging time communicating the status of this outage with their faculty and staff. And so the faculty and staff, especially the faculty, got quite upset, as you would imagine, that they were essentially without the tools they need to do their educating and research and didn't really understand why or when it was going to be fixed. Now, Rutgers had to get really serious about fixing this. You know, they couldn't just let it happen any time the attacker wanted it to happen. And there's a relatively new industry um, that offers ways to mitigate these attacks. And they have a whole range of options. In a minute, I'll talk a little bit about what iLight and IU are doing. One option is to have a cloud-based scrubber. That's the term of art. So it's a company that has hundreds or thousands of computers, usually spread out through the country or the world. And that company announces it's the path to your campus network. And all that bad traffic comes to that firm. And all those computers go through the traffic and get, discard the stuff that's part of the attack. And then they send to Rutgers what's left. So Rutgers finally got one of those in place. And the company has a dashboard. So you can look at the attack. Now, Rutgers had two 10 gig internet connections to internet service providers. So they knew it was more than 20 gig. Well, when they got the dashboard up, and, and so this big company could absorb hundreds of gigabits per second, they saw that the attack to them was over 90 gigabits per second. So if Rutgers had had a 100 gig connection to the internet, it probably would have been full. The options for mitigating this, as I said before, there's a wide range of them, and the cloud scrubbing service is sort of at one end of the range. And it can be extremely expensive. There are things in the middle. And let me talk a little bit about what iLight is doing. So really, there's this partnership between iLight, Indiana Gigapop, and IU. I never fully understand the difference between iLight and the Gigapop, and I probably should, but if, if any of you do, you can come explain this to me later. <laughs> Caroline doesn't count. I'm sure she knows. Um, we held a joint tabletop exercise. So, so at IU, we actually have some folks who are who do these on a frequent basis. We had a tabletop exercise. We got folks in a room and basically said, this is happening right now, and it's really bad. And there were a couple of us uh, who got to play the attackers. In other words, the folks in the room could ask us questions, and we could tell them what, you know, we, we could tell them what the symptoms would be. That was kind of fun. So through that exercise, we, we learned a lot, um, everything from things we need to have in place ahead of time to communicate to the community if this happens, all the way to ensuring that we have relationships with our internet service providers 
uh, that would allow us to quickly get a hold of them and mitigate the attack. We're also exploring uh, uh, vended mitigation capabilities. And I think David Hunter is here. And are we about to try someone's stuff? As far as vendors, we've talked to as many as I can find, and we're probably to the point now of trying to do an RFP for cloud mitigation services. Uh, we haven't decided if we're going to do just cloud or cloud and hardware, but I think it's probably a first step is just cloud. So, so we're moving along that. There's also uh, Internet 2 spun up an Internet 2 uh, uh, security working group. And I don't want to go over time. Marion, how long have I got? Three. Three minutes? Till three. Oh, okay. Um, that's plenty. So Internet 2 actually has a security working group. And while to join that group, you have to be an Internet 2 member, I believe, and I'll get this to Marianne, uh, there are links to webinars that the group had with uh, a handful of providers. And even if you're not interested in procuring those services, and I'll talk about why you probably aren't interested. Um, it, it will give you a good background. If you're interested in, in how these attacks work in detail, and kind of the set of options for mitigating them, the webinars are really good. Uh, and, and there is some marketing, but we warned them <laughs> that they couldn't do a lot of marketing, and the webinars turned out pretty good. There are so these attacks come in from our providers, and our providers don't like them. So in the case of Rutgers, the provider turned Rutgers off. Providers don't like hosting these attacks. They don't like those attacks consuming their bandwidth. In the case of Rutgers, it was probably consuming, consuming 90 gigabits of their provider's backbone. So providers generally have a way for a customer to signal them and say, traffic to this particular destination, in other words, traffic to the attack target, ISP, please drop that as it comes into your network. Don't even let it into your backbone. And there are ways to automate that so you don't pick up a phone and call the provider. You actually can, through BGP, which is the protocol we use to exchange routes, signal to them to please do that. And the Indiana Gigapop now has those mechanisms in place for all its providers, including Internet 2. And that's where you want it. You don't want an iLight member doing that. You actually want the Indiana Gigapop that has the relationship with the service providers. They're seen as sort of the customer, and the service providers are willing to do that. So that's a really big win. So if we had an attack like records today, it was somewhat agile. The attacker did move around in what he was attacking. But as soon as we saw what the attacker was targeting, we could tell our upstream providers to stop sending us that traffic. And that would work for any iLight member. The other piece that we're continuing to work on is improving the capability to detect them. Now, the short-lived ones are interesting to detect for a number of reasons. You might have unexplained network performance issues and so forth. And so seeing them that short-lived is good. But seeing all of them and understanding it's an attack is good. Remember I said the first one we had that we know of that caused a big service outage, we didn't know it was a DDoS attack. We were making changes on that equipment and we thought, ooh, you know, that's what happens, right? It, that's, that's what happens a lot of times. And so we're in the process of improving our capability to do those, to detect them. So I, I wrote a, a short article for EDUCAUSE, which we'll put a link up to. Uh, it, was meant, it was DDoS for CIOs and presidents. And I made some recommendations. And one of them was, uh, you know, at IU we had this tabletop exercise but it's probably worth bringing this subject up at a senior level. So it's still the case that anyone connected to the internet could be taken down for a substantial amount of time by a sophisticated high volume attack. 
And it's good to set that expectation. It's not terribly likely, but it can happen for weird reasons. You know, you can tick off a 13-year-old. Now, we did that through a tabletop exercise, and iLight would be happy to work with you to facilitate something like that, either individually or maybe collectively. You know, that will help you develop a plan, even if it's just a communications plan. What do we do if this happens? How do we provide good information internal, internally and externally about what's going on? I also think it would be useful to consider creating an iLight security working group. And DDoS might be its major focus, at least right now. So those folks on, who are iLight members who are interested, and you could do something similar to what the Internet 2 security working group, and any of the iLight members could participate in this. And that could involve getting vendors in, um, uh, iLight providing more information about what's going on to protect its members and members understanding what they can do maybe to, to help with that. You know, I, I talked about these unintended interconnected applications. So I, you, if I were, you were taken down, I couldn't get the box or uh, Canvas, our learning management system, from IU, nor can I get to it from home, because I have to get the IU to authenticate. That's going to be more the case, you know, pretty, you know, eventually about every critical system is going to have at least some component in the cloud. And iLight is going to have to step up to considering this um, another part of providing internet service. And the big ISPs are doing that as well. So this is kind of a new reality. Um, and it, there's nothing you could change architecturally about the internet to make this go away, but there are ways to mitigate it. This is gonna be around for a while. It will probably go up and down. Like I said, 15 years ago this happened but nobody talks about it much lately, but all of a sudden we got a wake-up call. I'll tell you a short, I went to um, a, a meeting of the Quilt, and the Quilt is an organization that has regional networks like iLight as members from all over the country. And I went there to talk about DDoS and the stuff that we were seeing and as we investigated it, making sure that people were aware of this, and in fact, talking to them about including language in their contracts with their internet service providers to ensure there was some way to deal with this. And most of the members of the quilt went, oh, I hadn't thought of that, thank you. And then there were a handful of members who said, we already deal with this every day. And it was the regional networks that support a lot of K through 12. So if you have a 10 gig connection, it takes a pretty big attack to affect you. But if you're K through 12 and you have a 100 meg connection and you have teenagers <laughs> who want to do some damage, it can happen a lot more frequently. And so those folks, I just found an interesting dynamic, the folks that were serving K through 12 were much more experienced with this. So that's what I had to say. Um, we'll put some information up on the highlight page. Uh, we'll be sure to get the pointer to the Internet to Security Working Group so you can see those webinars if you're interested. I'll put up the paper, which is a fascinating paper for geeks about that firm. So the, the guy who is the CEO of that firm that got attacked 15 years ago wrote security software for Windows. And so he actually dug into the bots. And the bots were using, I, I don't know who remembers this, but there used to be something called Internet Relay Chat, IRNC. I think that's right, Internet Relay Chat, because there's another IRNC. I'm probably saying that wrong. Um, and it was, it, was a, you know, it, was, it was essentially instant messaging on the Internet 15 years ago. And the bots would listen to one of those channels. And the attacker would tweet, essentially. You know, would send out a little tweet to tell the bots, go attack this site. 
So anyway, so uh, if you have questions, uh, my email address is just ssw, Steve Scott Wallace at IU, and we'll put some information up on the page. And I would encourage you to, you know, organize around this, maybe a security working group, and uh, it's a good thing to learn about. Thanks.